if you think sales is about convincing somebody to do something, you're doing it wrong, in my opinion. Sales is about helping people solve problems or achieve goals. That's it. Yeah. So, John, tell me a bit about yourself. How I discovered you is I've been going hard on LinkedIn. I've seen you have a massive presence on LinkedIn, and that's how I first discovered about you. And then I saw that you know you've been in the world of sales training. Sales. You have a company that you you've worked with like Google, Amazon, Salesforce, which is amazing. I guess. Tell me and the audience a bit about yourself and, and I guess a small story on how you got to where you are in the year today. Uh, yeah, I'll try to make it as brief as possible. But um, you know, grew up here in Boston. Uh, still live here, but went down to school at University of Maryland. Uh, got my and and went on every different uh, major you could get. Right, I went from art to science to math to everything and. And finally ended up in marketing because it was probably the easiest thing for me to get out of school with. And uh, when I was looking at jobs uh, for marketing, I didn't really, I didn't like the options. And so sales was not something, this was, you know, I'm 46 years old at this point. So back, you know, 25, 26, 27 years ago, there was no real major in sales uh, in the States here at least. And so I didn't really know much about it as a profession, uh, but DeWalt or Black & Decker uh, was very close to the University of Maryland. And so they recruited heavily out of University of Maryland and they had this position for, for um, DeWalt and it was kind of a sales position, but it was really event marketing. And so I, I joined DeWalt and drove around, gave away free tools to construction workers, which was cool. And then for about a year and a half after that, I decided I didn't want to do that anymore. And I, I got into Xerox. And that's really where I got my formal sales education. Uh, they, had, they had at the time they had a really world renowned sales training program uh, internally that everybody really admired. And, you know, if you want to learn how to sell <laughs> copiers, right? I mean, talk about selling a commodity. So, um, so I did that for, and I sold to local government too. So it wasn't even like, like I was selling, you know, my price was my price. There was not much I could do about it. So that's where I learned relationship selling. That's where I learned how to take rejection and everything else in between. And then, um, I didn't like that. I just had this itch. I didn't really like the corporate world. Um, it wasn't for me. I had this entrepreneurial itch that I didn't even know I had, but you know, both of my parents were entrepreneurs, uh, even though that's not what you called them back then. And so my buddy had started a company called Thrive Networks and it was a outsourced IT services company and it was self-funded and it was only three of them and they needed somebody to help with sales and marketing. So I ended up leaving Xerox and joining them as the VP of sales and marketing at, you know, 23 years old. And I didn't know what I was doing. So I, I took every training I could. I took Sandler, Miller, Hyman, Taz, Spin. I took all the trainings I could. And I came across this one company called Basho. And, and Basho was the first training that I took that I really liked because it was super tactical. It was, it was, it was easy to do and it worked. And so I used Basho, the, the sales training, to help grow Thrive. And we ended up being the fastest growing company in Massachusetts for about three or four years in a row there. Um, got us to about 85 employees and about 12 million in revenue. And then we sold off to Staples. So Staples came and bought us. And uh, I spent about a year going through that integration. Uh, come to find out, apparently, I'm not a corporate guy. Uh, you know, I don't have much of a filter and I really don't like playing politics. So after a little while, Staples offered me another position, which was a really nice way of firing me. And, uh, and I was looking for a job and, and, and Bastio came knocking and said, John, you want to be a trainer? And I was like, no. Uh, and they were like, why not? I'm like, I don't, I don't like trainers. And the reason was, is because up until that point in my career, I've met plenty since, but up until that point in my career, the only type of sales trainers I'd ever come across were either failed sales professionals or professional presenters. You know, and, and most people know the sales trainer, you could tell they've never really sold anything or if they did, it was like 20, 30 years ago. And so I didn't want to be that guy. And they said, John, don't worry, you have to use these techniques to sell so you can train so you can get paid. And I was like, all right, I like the whole practice what you preach thing. And so I joined them, uh, took on some bigger accounts, brought on some bigger ones. And then to make a very long story short, they screwed it up and I took it all over. So 2007 hit, uh, economy tanked, new CEO walked in the door, fired everybody on the spot. 
uh, and I scooped it up, uh, started another training company called Kensei Partners with the content. And then about four years after that, went off on my own with JB Sales. And now I work with, like you said, some of the fastest growing tech startups out there and tech companies in general, Salesforce, LinkedIn, Box, Dropbox, AWS, uh, Google, Okta, uh, a lot of the, you know, a lot of the SaaS tech companies here uh, in, in the States and, uh, you know, having some fun doing it. So, and I got a team now of 15 people. Um, you know, we have our professional services side that still does corporate training. And then we have an individual member side where we give all of that content that we train in video and, and format and different ways that people can consume it. So compared to the corporate training to the individual training, which one have you guys been more focused on or which is a bigger market for you? It, they're actually quite equal for us right now. We've evolved to the individual. So we went, um, you know, the business was basically built off of corporate B2B sales, you know, ACV 20 grand and above. Um, but we recognize that, uh, you know, when I created the online version of this uh, content, it was actually not for the B2C space. It wasn't for individuals. It was for my corporate clients because I was a one man show for a while and I was trying to figure out a way to add more value to my clients and also increase my average contract value. And so I created this online portal that had all this stuff in video format. And I said, well, you could use this to help reinforce and coach and all that other stuff. And then as that evolved, uh, you know, we started to offer it to individuals so that they could get the same exact training that, you know, Salesforce gets uh, and spends a lot more money on it. Um, and so that has evolved quite a bit over the years and has become our, our new focal point. Um, even though the corporate side is still very important to us uh, right now, the individual side of the house and the membership side and what we're doing, we run a daily show now. So we do a daily show where we do daily live content every single day. Um, and that's just free of charge. And we have a YouTube channel that's totally free that everybody can consume whatever they want to there. Uh, but if they want to take that next step and really take like core training that we deliver, then that's where you can purchase, you know, some of the licenses for the online content. So right now I'd say it's a pretty healthy mix, but we also have, um, sponsorships. So we, you know, a, a third revenue stream for us is sponsorships of those live events. And so what we've done is we've uncoupled our training core content slash membership. And we've said, you know what? anybody can be a member, just give us your email address. And that's where you get access to all the free stuff that we put out there. And then those people, if they want to go ahead and invest in themselves and purchase that, you know, that, that online content, they can. That's amazing. And the online course is majority of the people coming to that people who are members that join, you know, the, the membership portal, the free stuff. And are those people organically coming in from your LinkedIn, YouTube content? Yeah, it's a big flywheel that we have now. I mean, we're at a point now where we're, you know, we got a pretty decent presence out there and we do a lot of stuff, a lot of content. And so, it, you know, the, the top of the flywheel, right, is is to get as much, that's why we put as much free content out there as we possibly can. Because what we're trying to do is get you to give us your email address. Because as much as TikTok is out there and all these different, email is still the king when it comes to driving, you know, membership, driving uh, signups or all, all that stuff. Because once somebody gives you their email address and we curate our email, curate our email address really, really strong too. Like we do dupe it all the time if you're not active within you know if you're not if you don't engage with our content within two months we you know send you an email saying hey do you still want to be part of this and if you don't we scrub you out so our list is pretty tight and so yeah it, it kind of puts us in a position where we can um offer a lot of free stuff but but also you know pay the bills uh with with what we're doing um because you know we'll get i don't i don't know the exact numbers for you as far as your question is concerned is about like which one of our quote unquote members versus somebody who just finds us on linkedin or something like that my hunch says it's probably about 50 50 or 60 40 60 percent membership and then 40 percent just organic through search and everything else because we've been out there you know i've been doing this for 15 years at this point so so the amount of content that is out there that I've put out there is pretty significant. So from an SEO standpoint and everything else, it's, uh, it's, you know, we're out there. So people just kind of come across us, uh, organically in a lot of ways, but we're driving a lot more towards action items of people to purchase certain courses and everything else moving forward. With my sort of personal brand and all the content I push out, you know, let's say I reach 10,000 people each day, organically, I've seen probably 30 to 50 people sign up to study.com which is our free studying membership portal 
every single day organically. And then there's a lot yeah. of free courses that they can consume when it comes to e-commerce, smart Facebook ads, Google yeah. ads, TikTok. And then maybe out of the 50 that are consuming the free courses and just like hanging around on the portal, right. I might have one or two people that might be interested in one-on-one -on -one coaching a day. Yeah. Is that normal? Because in my mind, I'm like, maybe the reason why, like back in the days when it was just the 10,000 people on, on, on organic content, the only thing they could go to was booking a strategy session. I'd probably have like three or five people that was interested because there wasn't that middle step. And as I added right. in that middle step, it solved problems and all of a sudden my lead flow went down. Yeah. Yeah. And look, it's a constant game. I think those numbers are probably pretty, you know, accurate. And, and, and that's why we constantly tweak our model as far as what we're giving away for free and what we're charging for and those type of things. I mean, you know, I always tell people if you really wanted to, uh, you know, with all the content we put out there, you could probably cobble together 95% of what we charge people for, but it's the structure that we walk people through to that, that is the value, right? It's the same thing like here in, you can get out like here in Boston, you could actually get a, uh, a Harvard education for free. All their courses are online. You don't have to pay a dime. You don't get the Harvard degree, but you get the education, but still people spend $80,000 a year to go to Harvard, right? Because they want somebody to walk them through it. So I think with your coaching, I think that's a, that's, that's an interesting angle, right? Cause it's like, it, it's, if you're giving everything away that they can consume on their own versus have to talk to you for it for similar information well then like I, i'd rather consume this when i want to right but so the value of you has to be to help you know help show them how to put this stuff all together right and whether you do one-on-one -on -one coaching or a master class like i'll give you an example what we do i don't do corporate training anymore because i just don't have the bandwidth to so i don't do custom training for corporate clients anymore but i still love training and so so what I do is uh, every month I do a live session, the first week of the month and the second week of the month, and anybody can join. So, so if you're a thousand person sales organization, a thousand people can join me on, you know, the first Monday of the month when I deliver my filling the funnel course. If you're a one person show, you can join that as well. So it's, so it's not customized, but it's my live training of like really what I know how to do. Right. And so for instance, on our end, if you want our membership, right? It's, uh, and, and our membership is free. So give us your email address. You get access to all our free stuff. Well, if you want to invest in training, well, then we have this online content that is, that is, um, packaged and really professionally done, right? We go into studio for it. We have templates and resources and workbooks and all the stuff. So that's $365 for the year, right? You get, you get, you get all of our training, the same training I give to Salesforce, you, but you get in video format, right? For 365 bucks a year. But for a thousand dollars, you get that plus my live sessions. Now you don't get anything customized, right? But you get my live sessions and you get like an AMA with me once a month, right? So then, but then for $20,000, that's like when, you have, when you're a corporation and you want tailored training for your group that is based on this content, you're paying 20 grand for it. So it's like free 365,000, 20,000. And, you know, that those fluctuations, you know, we kind of tweak numbers here or there to see what people, what we're driving people towards. We run a special every once in a while for a certain thing, whatever. But, you know, it's all about what we found is that people will pay for access, um, not necessarily, you know, canned content. Um, the canned content is good, but the access is what they're looking for. And it could be perceived or real access. You know what I mean? Like, for instance, I tell everyone, I'm like, hey, everybody is part of that thousand dollar program. You got a Slack channel directly with me. You can literally Slack me anytime. People are like, oh, that's great. Nobody Slacks me. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, it, it's it's perceived access and, and they want to kind of feel part of something a little bit different. And that's where the personalization comes in. You know, the model that uh, a friend of mine, Ian Cognac, has gone to individual coaching model. And, and he's making a mint off of this because he just has these, you know, gold, silver, platinum programs. And if you're gold, you get this much of his time a month. If you're platinum, you're in this version. If you're, you know, silver, you're in this version, whatever. And it's varying degrees of access to him. So, uh, you know, I think it's just about playing with the numbers, right? You see, you see the numbers that dried up as far as people paying you. So, well, make some, you know, make some adjustments, still put a ton of value out there for free, but maybe gate the stuff that is really, you know, the special sauce. That's amazing. What's your thoughts on hitting, like how all your customers came in organically from your content marketing 
Um, and is that something that you rely on 100% or do you believe in building a cold sales funnel, run ads, collect yep. phone numbers, build out a sales center, get appointment setters, have appointment setters, yep. set the course for high ticket closers. Yep. I, so we grew up with professional services, B2B, you know, $20,000. So yes, I mean, that you, there, there's only so much marketing that'll drive a $20,000 order, a $50,000 order. Like that is direct selling, you know, that is target account lists, uh, ABM model where we're going after very specific accounts with a contact strategy, cold outreach, warming them up, obviously with some ABM stuff and everything else. So I think, yeah, in, in that regard, you, you know, if you're selling high ticket items, then you, you have to build that team because anybody who thinks PLG is going to save the day or marketing is going to be able to answer your question for somebody to drop $50,000 without actually talking to somebody, you're kind of out of your mind. At least my experience, I could be wrong, but based on what I've sold, people need to talk to you. You have to have somebody proactively going out there and selling it and trying to crack through the noise in some way, shape or form to very targeted, very specific customers that fit our ideal customer profile, not just to anybody. I think the mistake that a lot of people do is they'll take their, you know, their, um, ideal customer profile, and they'll just base it on very, very basic demographic information. You know what I mean? Like industry size, number of employees, and okay, here's my list of a thousand accounts that fit that mold, let's go. You know, that's not your ideal customer profile. That's a good starting point for your ideal customer profile, but you really need to dig into the details of who your solution, who your services fit the best and where they add the highest value. And that, you know, for us, we, we dig into second layer stuff when we're looking at our ICP, like, you know, what technologies do they use? What stage of the business are they at? Are they a series A or a series B or a series C rounds? You know, what's their, what's their enablement department look like? What's the structure of their department look like? You know, what are some of the things that are happening up to their clients, right? So, so not just our ICP, but who's their ICP? Who, who, so we really get detailed. And once we find those clients that truly fit where I think we can make a huge difference, then we go all in on, you know, proactive outbound selling to them. But when it comes to small uh, ACVs, like anything under $5,000, you know, I have a hard time building a sales team to of a bunch of people going out and selling $5,000 things because you have to have such a volume um, to be able to pay somebody enough to do that, that it's it's really hard to, to get to that point with, you know, $500,000 ACV type of stuff. Wow. I never thought like I would have always thought that the lower price item would work much better for cold traffic for people who have no idea who you are. But it seems like it's the complete opposite. You need to go to complete. You need to go really high end when it comes to if you want to run Facebook ads, collect leads that are interested in say e-commerce and convert them. Well, so there's, but there's two questions there, right? One is the marketing side that you just identified, right? Facebook ads and time stuff. Like that's all for it B2C. That's for low ACV stuff. So that when I say, I, I would actually go more marketing with smaller average contract values, right? So if you're $500,000, I wouldn't hire a single rep. I would go all marketing and do Facebook ads, retargeting, and I would probably hire more of a customer service person to take the inbound leads and educate people and not quote unquote sell them because once they've raised their hand, it's like, we don't need to sell them. Let's educate them through this process, right? So, but, you know, as a CEO of a Fortune 500 company sitting on a Facebook ad, no, absolutely not. Those are outbound me messaging, right? But not advertising. Um, so when I talk about, you know, account-based marketing, it's running webinars uh, for that persona and then using that information to then reach out to those people and, you know, share that content with them and, you know, build your, your hypothesis of why you can help them based on the information you gather, you know, research on that account and all that stuff. So I think we need to be careful of, of looking at outbound and coupling that with marketing because I, I look at those as two they're related obviously but when you're talking about pure outbound in my opinion outbound is like a cold email a cold a cold call to somebody who probably doesn't know much about you right hopefully they do because of your marketing but that's more brand awareness whereas you know direct selling is you got to go get that person on the phone but advertising is more the B2C world with 500, you know, 400, like our, our, for instance, our $365 product, right? 
I don't have sales reps making cold calls and sending cadences for $365. That's just not worth it. Right. So that's all, Hey, 10 to one and you know, Amazon, whatever, let's buy some ads. Let's put them up on Facebook. Let's try to drive people back to a lead flow magnet and whatever it is. Uh, but yeah, you, you, you have to go when you're going outbound to the mid market or enterprise space, you, you, you have to do some hand to hand combat with sales reps going out there and knocking on those doors. My opinion. That totally makes sense. And with that, $365 product, are you able to break even on that on the front end? Because I know how difficult it is to sell an info product to a complete cold audience. If it's retiring your existing audience, that's a different story. But trying to just hit cold people who have no idea you are, it's hard for them to just buy a free ebook just by shipping already. Yeah. So the cost, of, like, we don't, you know, because it's an asset that I've already invested in. And a lot of the traffic that we get, at least right now for it is organic. The cost of sale is actually pretty light. So, and it's very profitable because I built it three years, five, you know, 10 years ago at this point, I've been updating it ever since, but it's now the maintenance of the platform because it's just like a software, right? It's like the, the beauty of SaaS is doesn't really cost you all that much more money to send, you know, to sell the 101 version of the software versus the hundredth version of the software. Like as a business, there's not now as a professional services side, that's a totally different story. That is more of a one-to-one -one ratio, right? Like, uh, you know, one trainer equals X amount of revenue equals X amount of profit. And there's no scale there. It's just hire a bunch more trainers. But with the online content, that stuff's, you know, pre-baked. I already invested in it. So now every new sale is is just more and more profitable as we go. So I think it's it's how you, you know, uh, it's it's, I guess, what your strategy is from that standpoint, too. Like the cost of sale would be massive if I had somebody quote unquote, selling it, you know what I mean? Like an individual selling it, but the cost of sale is not that massive when we have the, the engine that we do with the, with the impressions that we can make and the free content that we put out there and we can drive people back to say, Hey, did you like that webinar? Oh, by the way, you know, we have a full course on something like that over here. If you want it, like, if you don't want it, no worries. Right. But it's not me making, calling you and saying, Hey, you know, thanks for joining the webinar. Do you want to buy, buy my $365 thing? Like you drop into a cadence for that, you know, when you, you, when you hit our webinars, you get your, you get two, three, four emails saying, Hey, thanks for joining the webinar. Here's the key takeaways. Here's some additional free resources. Oh, by the way, you know, do you want uh, some core training here? Yeah, Cause that topic was directly related to one of our core trainings and it's filling the funnel. It's been around forever. Um, and you know, it still drives incredible results for people, blah, blah, blah. So. That's amazing. Now, something that I've, discovered over the last six months and i'd love to get your thoughts and advice on it is that for the longest time like this was two or three years ago prior to that four years ago i did really really well with organic traffic we had a youtube channel um yeah. we had say twenty thousand subscribers and just off nice. that we were able to monetize it for like four hundred thousand a year which was insane yeah. it was just like every ten thousand subscribers we gained it was worth a hundred thousand dollars over a year time period and it was just crazy and yeah. for some reason, I thought in order to build a real business, because that model was a lot of ups and downs, you're relying on sure. YouTube, you're relying on inbound leads, and there was no control. I felt like I had no control over my business. So I thought in order to build a real business, I had to figure out cold traffic. So over a year, I tried everything from automated webinars to VSLs to phone call funnels, or run ads, collect phone numbers, and then call the phone numbers, and then if, like out of 400 phone numbers, 80 would pick up. Out of 80, that picks up. Maybe 20 would be qualified. Out of 20, maybe yeah. eight would show up. Out of eight, I'll close two people. So I turned $4,000 in leads into like $4,000. And I go through that list again. And it was so tiring and draining because it was yeah. like a 20 hour process in between. So I tried everything. And the conclusion I got to was one, I failed. I couldn't figure out cold traffic. And two, everyone I talked to was like content, like, the the playing the numbers game facebook and all these advertising platforms they're always going to try to squeeze your profit down to zero and there's a reason why webinars always breaks because that profit is being squeezed the cpms are getting more expensive right. and now i'm back to where i started i'm focusing on content and i'd love to get your thoughts on that journey 
Yeah, look, I think the when I got into this game, you know, sales training, you had a better shot at seeing God than a trainer giving away their content, right? Like if you had asked a trainer for their slide deck, it was like almost like, you know, the most offensive thing you could ask a trainer because it'd be like, oh, this is my IP and how dare you, right? I don't know whether it was because I wasn't the originator of some of this or whether I just had a different mentality than most, but I was always about, let, let me give as much of this stuff away as, as I possibly can and, and betting on the long term. And I think this is where the mentality has to be, right? If you're, if you're playing the short term game, then yeah, you got to find a, you got to figure out a short, short, re, you know, least path of resistance. Where can you get the most money quick as possible and try to do the lead funnel thing where it's this gets this because this, and, and I'm just going to run that thing. But if you're playing the long game, right I, you know i'm a big simon Sinek fan and he's you know he's got the book on the infinite game right and the and the concept of the infinite game is there's the finite game and then there's the infinite game the finite game is where you know we're in a, a rugby match or a you know a football match and it's there's a beginning and an end there's a winner and a loser right um and there's a timeline to it done whereas the infinite game is you're just so you're in the in the finite game i'm trying to win the game i'm trying to beat you right but in the fine in the infinite game i'm just trying to stay in the game and i've always had the mentality of i've always bet on the long term right obviously i need to pay my bills in the short term but once i have something that's kind of effectively paying my bills in the short term i'm taking a much longer term mentality on this which is why i've really focused on giving away as much free content as i possibly could over the years and building my personal brand from a credibility standpoint. So there's a lot to the content itself, but in our worlds, it's a lot about the brand too. Like your personal brand, my personal brand, do people trust this? Does it break through the noise? Um, you know, and and why should they trust me over anybody else? And that's that's you know not easy to to manufacture. You know what I mean? Like you that that's about being consistent and being consistently good and consistently putting out information that without very much you know asking for very much in return. And eventually that flywheel tends to you know get over the hump where people start to oh wow you know holy crap you know I've gotten so much value out of following you for the past six months that. I, you know, I got I almost feel obligated to give you some money for something here. And I think that's kind of where my head's at. It's it's just like the same reason I'm on TikTok right now. Like I'm on TikTok as a 46 year old man, get my ass handed to me by a bunch of 18 year old kids in their mom's basement screaming at me saying, I got, you know, all this dumb stuff that I'm an idiot. I'm not on TikTok because I'm looking for short term results. Like it, 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 if anybody asked me from a B2B standpoint, should I be on TikTok? It, the question is, is are you doing it for short term, midterm or long term goals? And if they're like, well, we want to, you know, create awareness. We're doing these campaigns so that we, I go, no, don't. Don't you dare do TikTok if you're looking for short term results from a B2B standpoint. I mean, I, I've done, I've been on TikTok for four months. There's, I've, there's over 2 million impressions, 2 million impressions in, in the, the content that I put out there like over 50,000 comments, uh, you know, over like 40,000 saved, you know, so I mean, the, 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 the clicks have been bananas, right? But you can't, so TikTok, it's not like Instagram yet, right? You have to go to my web, you have to go to my um, uh, profile page, you have to click on my link tree, and then you got to go see what I have to offer there, right? And the old, the experiment that I did with TikTok is, can I show some type of ROI here that that the TikTok brand awareness stuff is going to drive people to anything? I, not even to buy something, literally just to sign up, right? And out of the millions of impressions and the tons of comments and all that other stuff, I think a grand total of like 50 people have clicked on my link tree. And I think less than... 25 30 people have clicked on the podcast link in there and so you look at that and you say are you out of why why are you on tiktok right well it's because i'm not i'm i'm not on tiktok because i fundamentally believe that in the future I don't know how old you are, but I, you know, as 46, I, I Google stuff, right? So when I'm looking for something, I Google it, right? Well, the 15 year old kid at home is not Googling it anymore. They're TikToking it. That when they look for something, they they in it, so it's indexed on TikTok. That's where they're searching for information. So me being in a position that I am right now as the CEO of a company that I've been around for 12 to 15 years, I got a whole squad that's doing stuff for me and I can have the flexibility to do some stuff. I can bet on the long term with TikTok. I can be on there because I want in five, 10 years when those kids become decision makers and into the business world and they're searching for sales, sales training that I'm indexed on TikTok, right? So, but if I were to look at that as a short-term play, it would make zero sense for me to be on TikTok.
So I think it's the same thing with a content play. If you're looking for it as I want to put out content because I have an agenda here because I want to drive people towards this to buy this to buy this, you know, good luck. Your content better be really damn good and the stuff that you're going to charge them for better be even better. You know what I mean? But if you're doing it because, hey, I, this is really good content. And if I put it out in snippets, it's really going to help a lot of people and it's going to help build my personal brand and my credibility. And, and people then will see me as kind of a thought leader. So when I do have something to sell them, they'll be more apt to do it. That's the, that's the play. It's just a, in the short term world that we're in right now, nobody wants to put in the effort and everybody's too impatient, if you will, to, to, to get to that point. I mean, I'm, I could have easily gone the, the route of like, you know, the Grant Cardone's and the, you know, the douchebags of the world to get millions and millions of followers and get bots to, you know, make it look like I have 20 million followers, but it just, that was never my style. Like I never wanted the, the inauthentic engagement. I wanted real engagement for with real people who gave a shit about what I was putting out there. So I, I think you got to just have a different a mentality about it of, you know, it's a long game here. You know, there's kids that are coming out of school right now that want to be millionaires at 22 years old. It's like, dude, you know, you're, you have a 50 year career here. Like, I, like we'll slow down a little bit. Right. I, I'm not saying don't go for it. I'm just saying you got to put in the work and you can't be like an influencer coming out at 22 years old. Sorry. You're just not, you know, you can get viral. Don't get me wrong. Like you can go viral real easy these days. Uh, but as far as being an influencer, that somebody's actually going to engage with and look for value from and, and trust to give their money, that takes effort. That takes time. That totally makes sense. One thing I've noticed is that you really use the value ladder, like the um, Russell Brunson, the whole dot-com secrets model. And that's something I've always found hard to wrap my mind ahead. It felt like if you gave someone a seven, like free content, a $7, thingy ebook and a, a $99 sort of mini course and then like a $500 more in-depth course and then like a $5,000 coach but it felt like every time you would like sell people that one thing like if you put in 100 people say 99 of them would buy the $7 product so you already lost one and then out of the 99 maybe like only like 10 or 15 would buy the $50 course out of the 10 or 15 maybe one person buy five. so yep. it can feel like you're just losing people on the way up Whereas if you just put those hundred people on a hundred strategy sessions, you could close 10% of them at like a 3K course. Well, look, I think, again, I think it depends on the resources and where you are from a business standpoint. I, I think if you're that good at what you do and you have something that well to offer and you're highly curated with your content and it's that valuable, then yeah, you go targeted, right? And you get a few people to spend, you know, five grand with you as opposed to a whole bunch of people spending $7 with you. Um, that goes back to your ideal customer profile. Who are you selling to? You know what I mean? I, I think when people go into the world that we're in, as far as individuals, they don't really think of ICP. They just look at them as an individual. Like that's not true. Even within those individuals, there's, there's, there's nuances of who in that individual group is best suited for what I need or, or what I want to offer them. And if I really get, you know, tight on that, then then that then I market to them, then I add value to them, then my content aligns with them, and then they'll be willing to spend the five thousand dollars on me. Right. So I think it's it's your mass appeal of getting a whole bunch of people, you know, the gym membership, give us 10 bucks a month, and I'm just basically gonna give you as much content and it's all whether it's good or bad, it doesn't matter, but you're gonna get access to it, versus no 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 no. I like th like I only work with people who make $100,000 a year and want to make a half a million dollars a year mm -hmm. and live in this type of section, have this type of mentality, that type of stuff. Right. I mean, just think of like, you know, uh, personal trainers, you know what I mean? Like there's personal trainers that, that, that train the masses, right? Hey, everybody sign up for my cycle class for 10 bucks on Peloton or whatever the hell it is. But then there's personal trainers that come to your house, sit down with you, work with you and, and, and really create a plan for you. Right. I'm not spending the same amount of money on the person that comes to my house because I have a desire to get better and I need somebody to hold me accountable versus feeling good about myself because I have a $10 membership to the gym. You know what I mean? Like those are two completely different clients. And so I think it's, it's just, you need to know who, what you have to offer and who it adds the highest amount of value to, and then focus all of your efforts around finding those people, right? Retargeting whatever the hell it is and marketing to those people because they're the ones who will buy. But if you're trying to do all of it, if you're trying to get the person to spend five bucks and then you get this person to spend 50 bucks and then another person to spend a thousand bucks, you know, 
you're, you're going to confuse the marketplace and the people who are, who are, who would spend the thousand dollars don't really even want to be associated with the people that spend the seven dollars. You know what I mean? So what's your thoughts on the subscription model? Because that's another thing I've tried to like wrap my head around, because yeah. let's say you have a thousand dollar a year program and that requires you to have a team member jump on a call with that person to explain that thousand dollar a year program. Even if the close rate is twice as high as you doing at just a one-time payment of five thousand dollars, right? That one thousand dollars a year, that person needs to have a retention of two and a half years, yeah, to match that. And two and a half years retention is very difficult. Wouldn't it be better just to do yeah. the five thousand dollar product one time? Uh, so this is I've I've. <laughs> Uh, I've chased recurring revenue for my entire career and I wish somebody would have punched me right in the mouth about 20 years ago and said stop because there's there's recurring revenue and then there's passive income. Those are two very different things. In order to really generate recurring revenue, like true recurring revenue, you have to be adding recurring value. So I chased recurring revenue and I tried to manufacture it all day long. Like the, like my content, for instance, my pre-recorded content, I would charge you a membership fee and you would get access to it for a year. And then you would, I would be up for renewal in the new year. Do you want do you want to renew your membership? But my content is a consumable. Once you watch my training, you pretty much have my training. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, you go revisit or whatever it is. So so my renewal, my quote unquote renewal rates of this approach that I was trying were terrible because I wasn't adding any additional value to them in year two and year three and year four. Now, if you have a coaching thing, but even with a coaching thing, like I have a business coach, usually you only need a Well, you ideally, you probably only need a coach for a certain period of time. You know what I mean? Like, like I, I had my business coach and he, and he charged, you know, it was like a four month engagement and all this other stuff. And I said, okay, at the end of those four months, I was like, all right, I need it. There's a few more things that I want. But after the, the fifth month, he kept sending me these invoices and for these two hours and the two hours were like, I, I was actually educating him more in those two hours. And it was just more for us to catch up and I was getting no value out of him. So I canceled because I wasn't getting value out of the conversations anymore. If you're a software like Salesforce, that somebody is literally using every day to do their job, you can create, you, you have recurring revenue, you have recurring value. But if you're a professional services, it, to your point, we like, here's an example, 365 for the membership, right? For all our all on content. We used to say, oh, year over year. Now we just like, just give us $365 and you have it. Yeah, have it for as long as you want. I don't care if you got it for 10 years, 20 years, I don't give a shit. And you get all the new stuff that we put in there too, by the way, because, because it's a fool's errand to chase that and to your point it you know it seems alluring to get a bunch of ten dollars a month thirty dollars a month forty dollars a month but a thousand dollars a year oh uh, dude you know a thousand dollars a year is a number that people pay attention to on their credit card you know 20 bucks a month is probably something like you know my spotify i don't know 15.99 a month i've been paying that for the past 20 years you know 10 years and i don't even know what like I, and i use spotify a couple times a month at most you know, I think I'm still part of like three or four gym memberships at 10 bucks, 20 bucks. So if you got something that's 10, 20 bucks, okay. But if you're trying to do 500 a year, $1,000 a year, 200 bucks a month, $500 a month, that type of stuff, man, you better be adding so much goddamn value to my life that, you know, that, that I'm going to want to stay continually associated with this. Right. And if you get, if I get you to spend the thousand up front, well then, I can also sell you something else. You know what I mean? Like, here's another thing that, you know, oh, I just came up with this new program. And by the way, it's only $99. It's not the full thing, but this new product that we have for LinkedIn, you know what I mean? It's is it's 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 not part of that bundle that you bought, but it's for 99 bucks because you're a member, you get it, right? So that those are the games you can play. But man, trying to chase recurring revenue, uh, you know, unless you're in the software business, man, it's 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 a it's a slug fest. And and I think so many people get get uh recurring revenue confused with passive income passive income is fantastic don't get me wrong but it's not recurring revenue like I, on a sunday five people will buy my online content and I, like i don't know i didn't do anything i didn't i run it you know what i mean like i didn't cold call anybody for that and all of a sudden you know a few thousand bucks shows up in my in you know in my quickbooks and i'm like oh that's awesome that's passive income that's fantastic that's not recurring revenue though one thing that you brought up that's really interesting 
is the 10 to $19 a month product, where it's something that people just forget about. Like that's something that I've been really thinking about because you're right, it's low enough. Like they don't even, like them having to reach out and email support me, like, hey, can I cancel? That is enough difficulty for them to be like, oh, let me, I'll figure it out next week, next month, next month. Yep. That is something that does stack up and compound, even though it's much, much smaller. It, if you sort of play it really, really long term, that could potentially make more money than constantly pitching a three, four thousand dollar course. What's oh. your thoughts on that low price, and what would be the best way to approach a ten to twenty dollar a month service? I, I would, I, I would look at Patreon. So P A T R E O N. I was just looking it up here. Um, they've got that model. So any creator can can go on Patreon and set up and they have their platform. You put all their con your content on their platform and people pay 10 bucks a month to get access to it. And they can ask you questions and you get you put all your stuff on there. So I know a lot of people who have started a Patreon account because they're even on a side hustle. You know what I mean? Like they're working at their company, they're getting paid, whatever it is. But for some reason, they have some they're really good at whatever the thing is that they do, whether it's coaching or whatever it is. And so they start a Patreon account and then they just cultivate you know they build that 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 membership if you will and again you know there's no it's it's 10 bucks a month you can cancel at any time so as long as you're continuously adding value in there and putting new content in there and engaging with the audience you'll probably maintain a, a strong you know you'll probably get six to nine months out of everybody for who, for 10 bucks a month and then you just kind of keep promoting that and that's where you can build 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 and you, you know i know a couple of friends who are pulling in you know 20 to fifty thousand dollars a month just on patreon alone is it possible to get the flywheel effect in the online courses business because the biggest bottleneck and problem i was trying to solve was that it was always one in one out one in one out maybe every you know, 50 customer might bring that, bring in a friend and the mm. viral effect would never kick in. It's like sort of like a book. It's very mm. difficult. Most people buy a book and they don't even read it. Majority of people who buy a book, like 90% of the people who purchase the book, they haven't read it. So you're relying on the 10% to refer friends and the 10% yeah. can't make up for the 90% of people that didn't read a book. And it's nearly, it's impossible to get the viral effect to kick in. Yeah, I mean, there's got to be a certain volume for the flywheel effect to really kick into gear. You know what I mean? If you're talking 10, 20, 30, 50 people a month or 100 people a month type of thing, I think the flywheel, is, to your point, is really, really hard. But when you're in the thousands, you know what I mean? When you when you get a thousand people, like for us right now, our email distribution list is 50,000. So we put the emails out there and then we get more people in the front of the database because, you know, the webinars, the free webinars that we promote on LinkedIn and all that other stuff. So all of a sudden, right? So I think there is a tipping point where it does work but it's it's such a, a an uphill push to get to that tipping point that most people don't get there um so i think it's it yeah it's it's tough to you know uh like i said it's it's all about recurring value it's all about you know making sure that you're <laughs> staying consistent with what you're putting out there i mean that's where most people fail is because you could do this for a year or two yeah you know what i mean like you can put content out there for a year you can you can you know be like all in but two years five years ten years most people fall off because they don't see they they, they don't get to that tipping point they they get to the point where it's just like man this is just such a slog right and i don't know if and i'm just screw this i'm gonna give up i'm gonna go back to get a salary job because it's a hell of a lot easier right um but it goes back to that infinite game right is just what do you want to do and 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 you know experiment on on your way to get there i mean for me there's no strategies anymore i don't have a strategy on anything everything to me is an experiment so to me it's like what's my hypothesis on this and the whole team is the same way it's like what's the hypothesis does it align with what we're trying to accomplish great what's the beginning what's the end how are we going to measure this go and fail fast if it doesn't work try something else you know what I mean? And because we're just in such a dynamic world right now, nothing, there's no playbook anymore, right? For what works and what doesn't. And then, you know, all these online people will tell you, oh, you know, I have the exact formula that's going to help you go viral, or I'm going to get the exact formula that's going to help you drive millions of business. And they think it's like a, you know, an easy button where they just push this, you know, funnel thing and it works. It's like, you know, the amount of work it takes to crack through the noise right now is bananas. And so if you're not grinding every, 
day to try to, you know, add value to your community as much as you possibly can while getting paid to at least pay your bills, you know, you're going to, you're going to, you know, burn out and uh, you won't last. And so that's kind of what my, you know, 15 years have been like here or shit, I'm sorry, 26 years, like 15 years doing this, but 26 years in sales, right? 15 years of posting and doing my podcast and having conversations and sharing as much content as I possibly can. And, and, you know, and probably I could have monetized, I, I could probably be a multimillionaire right now if I was smarter. And, you know, and I had the experience that all these gurus talk about, but I've been pretty profitable from a growth standpoint. I'm pretty solid from a business standpoint and I'm, you know, and uh, nobody tells me what to do. I got I'm my own boss and you know what I mean? So, you know, it, it's, I guess it really depends on what your life goals are too, you know, bigger picture stuff where if you want to be that entrepreneur that's by, you know, that creates something that all of a sudden goes crazy busy, you know, and you get a hundred million dollars for it. Okay, good. You know, then work the algorithms and figure out the nuances here and try to, you know, play the game if you will. But that's to me, that's a, that's a finite game. You know what I mean? Like you started a company. If anybody starts a company with the idea of selling it, right? That's the end game for them. I think that's a failed, uh, I think that's a, a, a failed approach, right? You start a company because you believe in what you do and you think he's going to add a ton of value and you love doing it, right? And the output, if it's really, really good, will be a, an acquisition. But if you go in with a mentality of like, oh, I'm going to build this thing so I can sell it, like, eh, you're probably going to be very sorely disappointed and you're not going to last long enough to get to the point where it will sell because you'll, you'll, you won't, because if you don't love it, entrepreneurship is definitely not for you. You know what I mean? Like this, this is, this is way too hard of, uh, you know, there's way too many, uh, things you have to go through, ass kickings you have to take and stuff like that. And if you don't love what you do and genuinely believe what you're doing is making a difference, you end up bailing out really fast. I love that advice. One last topic I want to jump into is sales itself. Mm -hmm. One thing I really want to ask you, has sales gotten harder? Now, I guess a bit of context, mm -hmm. like. I remember two, three years ago, I'd be like, yeah, here, book in a strategy session or discovery call with me. And they'd be like, oh, cool. Let's jump on a call, go through their situation. Doing the same thing today. I remember I sent a link, someone reached out, they wanted help. Here, book in a strategy session with me. Their reply was, oh, so you can sort of go through and, and qualify me and then pitch me in the end. I was right. like, well, I was like, I did not expect that. Well, right. you jump on a call with someone and then so, Asking them, okay, so what brought you on the call today? How can we solve your problem? What's stop? They're already, you can see them be like, oh, oh shit, I thought I was going to get 45 minutes to just ask questions, but I'm mm -hmm. in a strategy call because I've been on two or three of these in the past. Mm -hmm. So has sales gotten harder? I think it, yes and no. Um... I think the noise has gotten a lot louder, right? The options for customers and the education from customers has gotten a lot better, right? Like there's corporate executive board talks about how by the time somebody comes to us, they're already, I don't know, whatever, 60 to 70% of the way through the sales process, right? Um, whether you believe that's that or not, long story short, when somebody does come to us, right? When somebody hits your website, they are educated. It's no longer, so if we, if we go way back, you know, to when I first started in sales, you know, around 2000 is when I really got into sales. And look, when I was in college, I, I didn't have a laptop. You know what I mean? The internet was was cool, but it was like I had to go to a lab to go to the internet. You know what I mean? Type of thing. So it was harder then because I didn't I didn't have a lot of information to go on. I literally had just names and numbers and a cold call thing. So I was hammering phones and I was making 400 dials a week and, you know, and I was grinding the shit out of it. Right. So in some regards, it was hard back then because we didn't have all the resources and the, but, but the problem or the, the difference though, was the client didn't either. So the client didn't have as much of an understanding of what the options were out there. So when I came to you and I cold called you and whatever, there's a, there was a possibility that you had actually never heard of something like I like what I was bringing to, and you were curious to be like, yeah, come on over, let's have this conversation. As we've evolved, clients have gotten more access to information. There's far more options out there for them. Uh, the noise has gotten absolutely deafening. But on the flip side, sales reps have got all these fucking tools that that make it 
if you're good, make it dead nuts easy to to skip so many steps. I mean, now I could go on your website, I could go on your LinkedIn profile, I could use these tools to understand what your last tweets were, what your trending is. I, I even know what your personality is. I, I have a tool right now, I can put your name into LinkedIn, it's called uh, Crystal Nose, and it can give me a disc profile of you and tell me if you're a high D or a low I or and, and how to talk to you and stuff like that. So if you're an actual business, if you have strong business acumen and you can actually carry a business conversation and you know how to use these tools, I actually think sales is way easier because now I don't have to go through the qualification and ask you 15 questions. I don't have to, you know, go through my dumb presentation, you know, 45 slides later and, and all that other stuff. I could just be like, yo, hey, uh, you know, I saw that you guys just did this the other day. And I know what, you know, from a publicly traded standpoint, you guys are trying to do these strategies here. And here's where my solution actually fits. And this is the component that and gets you to be like, holy shit, right? The problem is, is sales reps haven't really evolved. Sales reps are still going through the motions. They're still going through this linear sales process. They're, you know, they qualify and then they discover and then they demo and then they propose and then they close. And that's just not how the modern buyer works. The modern buyer comes in and out whenever the hell they want to and they want information and they want value in every, every single engagement. So if you can give value in every single engagement and you could leverage these resources to connect with people and cut through all the bullshit and talk about the stuff that matters, sales actually think is quite easy. But if you're going through the motions and you're stuck in sales, you know, 10, 20 years ago, and you're still kind of droning through and not leveraging these tools, asking the same dumb bant questions that you asked, giving the same dumb presentation that you've given for the past 10 years. Yeah, it's a hell of a lot harder because there's 700 more people out there doing it in the same industry as you, you know what I mean? And the client's getting bombarded with all of it and doesn't want to talk to any of us. I mean, there's some stats now, again, that talk, talk about how the buyer doesn't even want to talk to, like 86% of the buyers don't even want to have a conversation with a sales rep because they think it's that worthless. But that 14% that do, those are the reps. I think I think the vast majority of sales reps right now, uh, I think we're going through a transition phase. Uh, I think most at what, what I would consider SDRs and BDRs right now, the ones making cold calls or taking inbounds and stuff like that, I think th that's all getting replaced through technology. Um, I, I think most of that is going to roll up under marketing and operations and be a salaried position. And we're going to go back to full cycle sales with true account-based marketing and AI, giving them full cycle sales insights that then run full cycle sales. So that's going to be so for those sales reps, that small percentage, unfortunately, of sales reps, I think sales is going to be fantastic and they're going to add a ton of value and they're going to make a shitload of money moving forward. But for the vast majority of sales reps who are literally just going through the motions, asking basic questions, giving basic demos and not really paying attention and leveraging all this stuff, I think they're all going to get you know rolled up and replaced by technology. Now, that highly nuanced sales process where you're really tailoring you're like hey you know i know that you live here and you know you want to earn money because you'll come and you basically build out because you've done a lot of research prior you leveraging these tools is that only applicable to super high end three five hundred thousand dollar product and that's oh. not worth doing for a three thousand dollar product I, a two hundred dollar product I mean, think about it. If I walk into, think about the B2C, think, think about the consumerization of sales at this point, okay? How awesome does it feel for you to go on Amazon and get the recommendations of stuff that you want, right? Or go on to Instagram and see an ad that's like, holy shit, like that is, I actually want that thing, right? Like people get all hot and bothered about their tracking. I actually want them to track everything about me because I want you to know, I want this technology to know who I am and suggest things that I don't even know I need, but I, holy crap, right? So even it's a $5 product, I want that personalization, mm. right? So think about it this way. I, I go on, I go door to door selling for solar panels, right? And I spend, I don't know, five minutes doing research about who in the neighborhood has solar panels on their roof. You know what I mean? And I get the addresses of those people. And then I go find a list of people that, you know, I go on LinkedIn and I see if I can find the names of the people that live in those certain areas. I do a little bit of homework on what their job was and what their profession was. So when I knock on the door, 
I'm like, hey, you know, I know you probably don't want to talk to me right now, but, uh, you know, I've been doing some research in this area and 35% of the homes in this area have solar panels and those homes are selling at a 10% premium when they sell their houses because of this. And I know you're in this industry, which just seems to be a little bit transient. And I was wondering if you'd be open to, you know what I mean? Like just that talk track, if somebody comes and, and knows me, just shows even a little bit of knowledge about who I am, and that's not hard to come by these days, then I'm way more open than you showing up at my door and going, hi, John, um, we are XYZ Solar Company and we have the best solar panels in the industry and we can give you a no cost solution that will absolutely make sure that you get solar and don't have to pay for energy and blah, 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 blah. That's the same pitch I heard from 70 other solar panel kids. You know what I mean? And that's a door to door sale. So I think the personalization is, I think B2B sales has to be personalized it, it, or get replaced by technology that will personalize. Wow. The instant thing I thought of is like, it's not enough to go, hey, first name, last name. I noticed yeah. that your website, blah, blah, blah. You need to be like, hey, I noticed that you have a pet store and you know, I own a pet and I know how amazing yeah. it is to have high quality pets. Like you need to get a super duper niche and there are tools where you can now scrape all the pet stores and you yeah. can just go ahead and use the same template um, exactly. and have it really niche tweak down it. Support. Yeah. Just tweak that one personalization piece just to show me that you're a human being because almost everything can be done with computers right now. But literally, there's, there's AI tools and AI bots that I'm looking at right now that are literally writing emails better than I could ever write. And they're more personalized than I could ever be, right? And so you have to ask yourself right now, like, what can you do that a computer can't? That's the question that we all need to ask ourselves as sales professionals. What can you do that a computer can't? And that question is getting very hard to answer, right? Because if you can't, and it, and if you can't answer that question, you better start looking for another job because very soon that technology is going to come to replace that piece. And so people like what, uh, Gary Vaynerchuk is a, I'm a huge fan of, right? And I went to his 4D session. I met him and we talked. And this was right around this was 2017 where I, I, I came across these artificial intelligence emails that blew my mind. And it's literally what I trained people to do. And it was better than what I trained people to do. I was like, holy shit. And you do a QA and a at the end. And, and I asked Gary, I said, Gary, you know, I just saw this AI bot that writes emails better than I could. I go, where does that leave us as, as, as sales reps? I'm like, are we pretty much screwed here? And he was like, don't worry about the technology. He goes, you're not going to win against the technology, but be the last mile, right? Let the technology do all the heavy lifting. Let it surface all the information and let it even write a decent amount of whatever you want to write or create whatever you want to create. But right before it hits that inbox, right before it goes to the other human, make sure you humanize it. Make sure you tweak it to the point where you can actually tell that this is human. Because until computers start buying from computers, like once computers buy from computers, we're screwed, okay? But as long as there's a human being on the other end of that line that we're trying to connect with here, then you have we have a chance. We just have to stop thinking about selling people, right? I, I talk, I tell people this all the time. If you are, if you think sales is about convincing somebody to do something, you're doing it wrong, in my opinion. Sales is about helping people solve problems or achieve goals. That's it. And if you can't, if my goal, if your goals aren't big enough and your problems aren't big enough, why are we having this conversation? That's it. And if you look at it that way, where you're here to help people make decisions, you're here to help them solve their problems, then you actually genuinely give a shit. Then you actually show empathy. Then you actually ask the right questions. Then you don't care about your BANT qualification shit. You know what I mean? And you disqualify more than you actually qualify. And that's where you gain credibility with people. I tell people all the time, I disqualify opportunities nine more, way more than I qualify. Because as soon as I get into a situation where I'm like, okay, you kind of look like somebody I could help here or whatever. I'm like, all right, good. Then I start asking all the questions of why you shouldn't do business with me. Like, why don't you do it this way? Why wouldn't you do it this way? Why don't you re use that resource? And why wouldn't you do it online for free? And blah, 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 blah. blah. Because those, those are all things that people are going to come up with anyways. They're all going to figure that out eventually. If it's not them, it's going to be their peer or their boss or whoever it is. So I might as well get those out of the way first. And by the way, guess why? By, by, by disqualifying and telling people what I'm not good at. And actually, you know, I don't think you need that. I think you need this instead. And that's not me. So you should go talk. You know how much credibility you buy there? And again, if you're playing the infinite game, you might not get that sale. But later on, they'll remember. That's so interesting. I think you're right. When it comes to outbound, it needs to be way more personalized. 
when it comes to inbound, the yeah, the sales has has been going through a transition. The days of digging, finding that pain, being what your sort of goal is, why you want to make that much money, tell me what house you want to buy, and, and bring them to the whole process, yeah. no longer work. It's like too corny, and the new process. I feel like we're transitioning to, or based on what I'm hearing and talking to other sales experts, it's like get through the pitch and qualification as quick as possible. In the first 10 minutes, you want to be like, why are you here? What can we solve? Why can't you solve it? How long have you been looking for a solution? Why are you looking for help rather than now than later? Get here's our pitch. Get that done in the first 15 minutes. That used to be unheard of. You can only pitch after 30 minutes. But now it's like within the 10 minutes and go straight into objection handling. And I was like, whoa, like, I'm not that good at objection handling because previously I've been getting, um, I've been like wooing people to a point where they're like, okay, here's my money. Uh, you've listened to me. You've let me pour right. my heart out. I don't, I don't have any objections, but now it's like, that doesn't work. I need to jump straight and up and I'm learning. Now I'm having to relearn and just focus on objection handling. Go straight to the, oh, you need to think about, well, you told me that you've been looking for a problem for the last six months. Do you want to look for another six months? Oh, like, what do you want? And it's like, wow, like I'm not good at this and I need to relearn. Yeah. And I think again, if you're like, you know, you just need to be proactive about, you know, those objections are coming, deal with them before they come up. Be like, hey, let me ask you a question. Like, why wouldn't you just wait another? Se- like, before that, the, before that objection even comes out of their mouth, like, why would you do this now? Why wouldn't you just wait another six months to do this? The economy's shitty. Everybody's kind of questioning what's going on, and everybody's circling back, you know, tightening up their their budgets right now. So, why would you do this today versus waiting six months to see how things shake out and have them tell you? Well, actually, a good question. Well, you had said earlier that the, one of the big reasons is da 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 da, and so I'm a little confused why you would do it now versus then, right? That type of thing, and it's it's more of a conversation. It's not a pitch. Like I said, if you're trying to convince me of something, you've done it wrong, man. Like you, you know, you got to get me up. You got to hook me. Um, but then very quickly, if you're not, if I don't, if I can't tell that you're really genuinely trying to help me solve a problem, I'm going to go find somebody else that will. One problem I've been going into with that process is like within the first 10 minutes, and this has saved me a lot of time. I could find out that, oh, wow, you don't, you're not looking for one-on-one help. You don't want to get help with me. And then it's like, you basically you tell them, Hey, do I looking for one-on-one help? And then they mm-hmm. say no. And then you're sort of done there. Uh, and I've noticed I'm just de-qualifying a ton of people when previously I would have taken them through the whole process and some of them would have had that initial mindset, but through the whole process, they would have changed. But if I reuse that process, one, I'm just going to be wasting a lot more time. Close rates are going to be much lower, but I am most likely going to still be making more money than this more, more like this new yeah. approach. But you're right, it's not, it's more short term. Well, again, let's go back to it. If you really tighten up on your ICP of who you add the highest value to and and you qualify them to the point where you can tell that this is the type of person that you can add the highest value to. And then you get into a brief conversation with them about kind of what they're trying to accomplish and what their main, you know, how we can help and everything like that. And then you come out, are you looking for one-on-one? Uh, then then why are we having this conversation like you the, then that then it's kind of like well if I, if you're the right type of person that i've focused on and i've driven you and i've educated you to the point where you reach out to me and you know what i do and now you're telling me that you don't want one-on-one training like why the hell what then how did we why are we even having this conversation then because you right. know by that time that this is what this is about right mm-hmm. and so that's where you can be very confident in closing you know in 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 closing or disqualifying because they're not the right fit and you don't want to force something in that's not the right fit and and this is the last thing i'll say and then i got to go here but you know people ask me you know how hard can you push right how hard can you push to get a deal done right end of the month end of the quarter end of the year whatever the 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 response to that is it is in direct proportion to how much it is in your best interest versus their best interest if it is in their best interest because they fit that right model that you know you can add value and they really have a problem that is impacting whatever it is, right? And you know you can help. Then you can and you should push as hard as you want because it is in their best interest. But if it is just in your best interest because you got to close the end of the month, you got to close the end of the quarter, you got to close the end of the year, then you're just a jackass sales rep and there's not much I can do for you. So the idea is 
find the right client with the right product match. Don't sell to anybody who isn't that perfect fit because if they are, if, if you have to stretch, then that takes away your credibility. You get bad reviews. You It takes away from doing business to the right type of clients. But when you have that fit, then you push, then you lean in, then you then you say, wait a minute, I don't, now objections are, I'm not doing a technique to handle an objection. I'm genuinely confused right now. Uh, like, I, I'm sorry, based on what you told me, you said this problem is worth X to you at this point and I have a solution here. So don't tell me I'm too expensive. Tell me you don't believe that my solution can fix your problem. Tell me that. Like when people tell me like, this is why again, my a I ACV is $20,000. So one of my criteria is if you're not, if, if your ACV isn't $20,000 or above, I don't really want to talk to you for my corporate stuff. Because if your ACV is $500 and I'm coming after you with $20,000, you're going to have to sell a lot of these $500, $5,000 things to make up for that, right? But if your average contract value is $50,000, we are not having the conversation about price. Because again, when you tell me, you, John, you're too expensive, I go, stop it. Shut up. Don't tell me I'm too expensive. Because I do sales training and I do prospecting and negotiation. So what you're telling me right there is that you don't think that after my training, you're going to get one new deal that you would have gotten otherwise, right? You don't, that, that's what you're telling me. Yeah. So that, so therefore I'm not too expensive. You just don't believe that my, that what I have can solve your problem. That's what you're saying to me. So shut up about being too expensive. And that's, you know, and if that's my fault, because I didn't, I didn't present this well enough or I didn't find the right fit, then so be it. But don't tell me I'm too expensive. I don't discount, period. Never have, never will. I love that. John, where can people find more about what you do, learn and, and get more of this? Yeah. Yeah. So again, we got a ton of free stuff out there. You can, uh, my handle on everything. So Twitter, TikTok, and Instagram is John M as in Michael Barrow. So B-A-R-R-O-W-S. Um, all of that's, uh, I give away a ton of free consulting on Instagram specifically, and then, um, sell better X, Y, Z. That's our website and our YouTube channel as well. So sell better dot X, Y, Z is our YouTube channel where we put all of our free content out there. Thank you very much for your time today, John. I know we went over time. I love how just real raw you are. I love the fact you talk about, Hey, like this isn't easy. When I, when I'm asking questions about the problems I'm dealing with, you're more than happy to be like, yeah, like as an online course, it, it's it, the problem, like we face that and that's a real problem and you're not trying to come up with some, you're just real at it. Like if, if something's difficult, you're like, it's difficult. And, and I love that about you. Yeah. I mean, this is, none of this is easy. Anybody who tells you it is, is full of shit. Uh, it's really rewarding, uh, but it ain't easy. And it shouldn't be in my opinion, so. Thank you so much for your time today. Anyone that's listening, really, if you made it this far, thank you so much for spending your last 60 minutes on this episode. I really appreciate it. Please let me know. Put a review on Spotify and Apple. I want to get your thoughts. I want to read your feedback so I can learn how I can improve. So please give me some uh, reviews so I can know if I'm doing things right or wrong. And hopefully you guys got value today and I'll see you guys next week with another episode. Peace.